and turn to the book of Acts. We're in chapter 10 tonight, starting there. And uh, Lord willing, working our way through chapter 11. So what we've seen so far is the development of the church, the, the initiation of the church or the birth of the church, and then the growth and development of the church. And uh, it's been fun to watch how that's all happening and to understand and see it was the Holy Spirit working in the life of, of people, of individuals that had allowed the church to grow so much so fast and it was spreading. And so we're going to pick that up tonight. We're going to see the continual growth and development of the church. In particular, tonight we're going to see a big barrier being crossed. Huge barrier tonight. And that barrier is that the gospel is not only going to the Jews now, but now the gospel is going to go out to the Gentiles and be preached to the Gentiles and be emphasized towards the Gentiles. And so um, let's take a look. Chapter 10 of the book of Acts. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. So our story then focuses on this particular individual and this particular individual it's noted about him that he was a centurion which means that he was a Roman soldier in charge of a hundred other Roman soldiers it says that he was of the Italian regiment which means uh, the regiment is another uh, word for cohort which cohorts would have 600 men in that particular um, section of the military so he would be in charge of a hundred men out of the 600 men it tells us their location their location is in a place called Caesarea this place is a place that uh, we go to on our travels in Israel this is one of the really cool places to go through go to there's a huge Roman amphitheater there um, that, that dates all the way back to these times here. And um, Caesarea was a seaport, and it's now called or known as Caesarea Maritime. There's another place called Caesarea, but that's a, a different Caesarea. And, and the reason they're named Caesarea because they're named after the Caesars. And so... Um, this Caesarea is beautiful location right on the Mediterranean Sea. This is where the Romans would station themselves who were in charge of the area of Judea, which Judea was the area where Jerusalem was in. And this would be because the Roman Empire was ruling over the world at this time, their military would be stationed there and they would have charge over the area of Judea, which was where primarily most of the Jews were. And in particular, Jerusalem was there in Judea, and that's where, of course, the temple was. So we get a lot of information right in this first verse about Cornelius. And it says that he was a devout man, and he was one that feared God with all his household, and he gave alms generously to the people and he prayed to God always so if the first verse didn't strike you very much the second verse should be pretty striking because you have a Roman soldier living in the Roman Empire which was heavily influenced by Greek philosophies and traditions and because of that the Romans because the Romans conquered the world after the Greeks conquered the world and so much of the Greek influence went into the Roman culture as well a big part of that was worshiping all sorts of deities and what they would call gods they had a lot of gods they would be 
called pantheistic. So their gods, really, it's interesting, were sort of a reflection of their own feelings and emotions. And so because of their feelings and emotions and their fleshly desires, they would make gods that would reflect those feelings. And then they would be able to act on their feelings and say it was a worship to a particular God. So if, if you had lust, then you'd say, I'm going to worship a particular God, the God of fertility or the God of lust. And so they would be saying that would be um, how they would worship their gods. So it's really what it is, is uh, humanism, a man-made re religion, sort of, with a spin to where these gods are really reflective of their own desires and what they want to do. Here's the thing, what's really interesting. We know that giving into the flesh, hedonism, if you want to call it that, which is what that's called, just doing whatever you feel like doing and fulfilling all the desires of your flesh, it gets to a point where it's very destructive. And the Bible tells us that the deeds of our flesh bring forth death. And so there's a price to pay when one lives like that. And so the Romans, this particular Cornelius, kind of like today, you'd see the, what's going on in our world and you'd be very concerned and you'd be sort of protective if you had a family and say, I don't want my family to embrace these ideologies and to embrace these lifestyles and embrace our culture. So you would pull them away, but you would pull them away. And by pulling them away, you'd have to pull them into something, whether it's morality or some sort of religion or something like that. So there was a group of people like Cornelius who was actually, he would see and live among the Jews and recognize that those, th those Jews really uh, seemed to have morals and they seemed to have structure and they seemed to value family. And so there was a, a, a group of Romans who were not Jews, but they respected the God of the Jews. That's why it, it was uh, said about Cornelius that he, he, was a, a, he feared God or was a God-fearer, meaning he wanted to acknowledge and live the lifestyle of the Jews who worshipped one God. He appreciated that. And so it says he was a devout man, meaning he was a devout in the way he lived his life. Again, he wasn't a Jew because to be a Jew, you would have to convert to Judaism and live under their laws and be circumcised and um, do the rituals that they would do and all. He didn't embrace all of that, he, but he embraced their God. So something interesting about Cornelius, when, when one embraces the true God, even though they may not fully understand and may not fully get it, they're on their way somewhere, aren't they? And so he gave alms, meaning he, 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 he did, he helped the poor and he, he gave and he helped. So in that culture for a Roman soldier to have these characteristics is pretty striking. So then it continues on and it says about the ninth hour of the day, which would be 3 p.m., he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. Isn't that, don't, doesn't that always happen? Angels come and people are afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? In other words, he's referring to this angel in a way of respect, not in a way of deity, not the big L Lord, not God. But he's, he's recognizing, and remember, he's a centurion. He's a Roman soldier who's in charge of 100 people. He has, he's a, a man, established man of power and position. And this angel comes, he recognizes something that is above his pay grade or above his power grade, 
or something supernatural. And so he addresses the angel that way and says, Sir, or Lord, he says, what do you, what do you want? And he, and he says, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now, that's amazing. Because you will find so often in the Bible that there's these statements like this, that God has done something as a result of prayer. And in this case, prayer and alms. So... God is working, God is moving, and it's pointed out that that was a result of him praying. Because that's important. Sometimes we, we wonder, like, if, if we pray, is it doing anything? Are we just mumbling words and reciting things and, you know, that? But, but we find so often, this is an amazing case, that, that the angel says, your, your prayers have been heard, that's why I'm here, he's saying. I heard your prayer, now I'm here. And then he says, he has a message. He says, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. So his directions are about 30 miles south in Joppa, which is another place that we go when we go to Israel. You go, go to this place in Joppa. And take some people with you. Or I'm sorry, not take people with you, but send people. You can order people around. Send men down to Joppa, which again, 30 miles down south from the coast, from where he was. And there you'll, you'll find somebody. You'll see somebody there. And in verse 6, he says, he is, he is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea, and he, he will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continuously. And so when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So, God's going to do something here. A big thing. This is a huge thing. This is monumental for the church and for what Jesus came to do, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. John 3.16, for God so loved the what? The world. Um, the commandment, in, or in Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit would come upon the early church and they would go from Jerusalem to Samaria to Judea to the other ends of the earth. It's the spread. And the message was that the gospel is for everybody. And that was radical in their day because the Jewish thought was so strong and ingrained in their mind that they were God's people, that God would come only for them, that God only cared about them, that the Gentiles or the non-Jews, that they, they were dirty, they were filthy. It was so ingrained in them that they could never go into a Gentile's house, which you're already starting to see the developments of the gospel in the heart of Peter because he's staying in Simon the Tanner's house who a Jew would not be able to stay in a Tanner's house because of the dead bodies of the animals, of the animal hides. And, but Peter's there. And we see this huge development of God breaking down these barriers of ethnicity and social classes and all of these things that the gospel, and, and this is, this is unique to this time. This has never happened religiously where the religion would go to a different ethnic group or a different group of people. This is radical, groundbreaking stuff. And, and think about the, the faith that Cornelius had, even though 
At this point, he wasn't born again. He didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside of him. But he was a God-fearer, and God was honoring the light that he had at the moment. So he had a little light. He saw the God of the Jews. He saw that there's one God. He believed in that one God. And, and so he lived his life according to these morals and these values that were uh, expressed through the Jews. He was not hedonistic. And as a Roman soldier, he could have used his position to do a lot of things hedonistically to fulfill his flesh. But he didn't. And there's this light and, and then God begins to minister to him. And God gives him a, a part of this huge thing that he's doing. And he sends three men down, 30 miles down the coast to Joppa, which is very interesting because Joppa is another notable city of an Old Testament prophet. Do you know who that is? Jonah. Very good. Jonah went to Joppa to do what? Run from God. He, Jonah went there to run from God. God had called Jonah to preach the good news to the Ninevites. And Jonah hated the Ninevites and didn't want to do that. So he's trying to run away from God's calling. This is where God is sending, or Cornelius is sending his people. And all he's told is that there will be somebody there. You don't know who he is, but he'll be there. And he has to have the faith to send his men. I mean, imagine if he was just making this up, how foolish he would look to send men down there. Oh, I had a, a vision. And, oh, the, you know, God told me to send you down there. And there's going to be a guy there. So he's exercising faith now in what he knows and what he understands. So in verse 9, the next day, they went on their journey and they drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray and it was about the sixth hour. So now we're seeing a perspective from the other angle. And this is amazing because God works from different angles. We often see things only from our angle, but we don't realize that God's doing something from someone else's angle to bring about certain things that he wants to do in our life. So now we look at Peter. So Cornelius, Cornelius has his guys going down. They're already there. And Peter's going about his business. Peter is in uh, Joppa. He's at a certain house, Simon the Tanner's house. And he's praying. He goes up to the rooftop. Why did he go to the roof and pray? It might seem weird to us, but in, the, in their day and the way the houses were made, the rooftop was part of their house. It would be flat and they would go up there and uh, he would probably have a great view from there. He'd probably have an ocean view. So it, it says when he, he's up there praying, another amazing characteristic about Peter and about this story, that God is working through all these people praying says, then he became very hungry and he wanted to eat. But while they made ready, while they're making the food, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. So in this sheet that he sees coming down from heaven in this vision, and notice through prayer, God is communicating to these two individuals in different ways, but, but no doubt it's God communicating to them. And the, the sheet had a, a mixture of, of in the Jewish tradition of unclean and clean type of foods. The, he was seeing animals, but these were things that they, they could and couldn't eat. The, things that were kosher and things were, that were not kosher. 
And as he sees this, if you're a hunter here, he says the most exciting words in the Bible for you, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So that's the hunter's verse. And Peter says, the weirdest thing. See how weird this is to you. Not so, Lord. That doesn't make sense, does it? Remember Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Just when you call God Lord, now this is a big L. This is not, sir, this is saying you're the Lord of my life. This is the, what he's saying. He's saying you're the chief of my life. You're the boss of my life. You're the master of my life. Now, it doesn't make sense to say no. Not so, Lord. And this is a problem that we've seen with Peter that God is continually sanctifying out of him. But even after Peter's denial, Peter's restoration, Peter's being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter spending time with the risen Jesus, we still see the Lord working these things out. He has certain things that are so ingrained in his thinking. If you remember another occasion where in Matthew 16, uh, 21 or 22 right in there, where Jesus was saying that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and Peter actually pulled him aside and rebuked him for saying that. And what did Jesus say to him? Do you remember that? Get behind me, Satan. And then on another occasion, uh, you, you remember with, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. And, and Peter said, well, you know, well, if that's good, we'll wash all of me. And Jesus rebuked him there. And, and he said, well, and then, and then he said, well, don't wash, I'm sorry. He, he said, don't wash, don't do that to me. I'm not worthy. And Jesus said, if you don't do this, you have no part in me. And then he said, well, wash all of me. But he just kept, you know, getting off track and, and misunderstanding and overstepping. And, you know, uh, just another example on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and he sees this vision or he sees not the vision the actual Jesus transfigured and and then he sees Moses and Elijah and he 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 starts going off and talking and let's build tabernacles for all and God just cuts them off and says just be quiet just stop talking but see this is encouraging for me because a lot of times we think well Peter was one way but immediately after his restor restoration, John 21, then he is completely different after that. And, and we see here, he's still not. He's still working these things out. And, and so his tradition is what's being broken down. And, and, and a lot of times people have such a hard time with the simplicity of following Jesus without the formality and traditions and rituals but just worshiping Jesus in spirit and in truth. And if you've come from a very traditional background, and there are a lot of very physical, tangible type of ways that you worship, then the freedom of just having the Holy Spirit live in you and just worshiping God in spirit and in truth wherever you go and whatever you're doing and, and not to go by man-made traditions can be very hard. And Peter's being broken of that. And he says, not so, Lord. He said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. And he said, the voice said, what God has cleansed, you must not call uncommon. And this was done three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. And so we can get frustrated either with ourselves or with other people when they don't get it the first time or when they don't meet our expectations in how they're growing. And so we have to be careful about that because you see Peter, who was 
one of the most, if not the most privileged individuals spiritually on the planet that has ever lived to be able to spend time physically with Jesus, to be an apostle, to hear him speak, to watch his miracles. And he was struggling. And three times, I don't know, we don't know, but it's interesting. Seems like three times is a charm for him. He's a three time guy. <laughs> so maybe this it was just a thing with him. He just needed to hear it, he needed to see it, he needed to have it reinforced. And God is gracious, he did that. And so, so does Peter get it? Does he understand? Well, in verse 17, now it says, While Peter wondered within himself about the vision which he had seen and what it meant, behold, the, the men which had been sent from Cornelius, had made inquiry for Simon's house, and they stood before the gate. So now the other perspective. Cornelius' men are there, and they're probably wondering and asking, is there a Peter here, and where's this Peter? And they have this commission, and they're, they're just being obedient to what Cornelius had told them to do. That's their job. They're soldiers. They're um, under his authority. And so they're just doing that. And at the same time, Peter is getting a vision from God. And that's really, really helpful to understand that God often works in ways to where he confirms what he's doing, not only by just placing on our heart, but in many ways then reinforcing that with putting it on other people's hearts. And we have to be careful if we just were the only ones, we have a rogue idea and we go for it, but other people aren't quite into it. Be careful of forcing or pushing that because if, if it's the Lord, he'll open the way. One of the things that I was praying about as an assistant pastor in California, as God began to stir my heart about the, the possibility of planning a church somewhere, and I began to feel this calling to do that, but I said to myself, Lord, if you're going to do that, I'm open to it. I just want to know it's you. And one of the things I prayed and asked the Lord is that, that my pastor would come to me and suggest and ask if that's something that the Lord's leading me to do instead of me initiating it. And the reason why I just, and, and that's not a rule, that's just for me, I didn't want to feel like I'm pushing this thing or initiating this thing. You don't want to go off and, and you know, do something if it's not the Lord. And sure enough, one day, it happened exactly like that. I get to work at, nine in the morning and I walk into my office and he walks into my office and shuts the door. And he says, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah. And he said, I really feel like the Lord is calling you to, to plant a church. I think you're ready. Have, and then he says, have you ever thought about it or prayed about it? <laughs> and so he was working from, from that angle because in that situation, you know, for me to leave, I didn't want to leave on my own accord and leave the church in not a good condition. But if it's the Lord, it's good for everybody. And so that, that's an example, but a, a great lesson here that when God is working, that he's, He'll work from different angles. He'll, he'll make it obvious and it, He'll make it um, convincing to, to other people, especially if other people need to be involved in the particular decision. So we can't just say, well, the Lord's leading me to do this. I don't know. Say the Lord's put it on your heart if you're single to marry somebody, but the Lord didn't put it on their heart. So that's an example. So then you can say, well, pray about it and see if God puts it on your heart. But see, this is, this is what God is doing, and He's working so amazingly from these different angles. And that's what I found, that, that God works from so many different angles just to make something very obvious. 
So there at the door, Peter was praying. In verse 19, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit, so here's a, another thing that's happening. The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. So here's another thing that's happening. So you, you see all these confirmations coming into place. So now the Spirit is putting it on his heart, confirming what he's doing. And then the men are there because God sent them there through Cornelius. In verse 20 it says, Arise, therefore, and go down with them, doubting nothing. For I have sent them. So that's the huge word, or two words. Circle that, doubting nothing. What that means is, at this point, the Lord had given him everything that he needed to know. The Lord had convinced him. And you think about the vision. Peter would be very familiar with spiritual things at the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, witnessing the miracles that Jesus was doing and things like that. And God even gave him another confirmation. So the Spirit told him to go down. And then there are actually people there that he couldn't have known or known about it. And so there, there comes a point. Here's the point. There comes a point when we have to stop saying, Lord, is that you? Lord, can you send me another sign? Lord, can you convince me? There comes a point where the Lord's going to say, you already know. And he did that to me. So when I was going around and praying and seeking the Lord about where he'd want me to plant a church, it's a long story, but just to abbreviate it, he led me to this area and I remember praying over and over again. I, I had peace in my heart. I had excitement in my heart. And I kept praying, Lord, show me. How, how do I know, Lord? And he told me that. He said, you already know. And I did. I just couldn't take that step of faith. And at that point, that was the difference. I did know. I knew it was the Lord. I knew it wasn't me. And I, and I knew that was the step of faith I had to take. And that was the moment where I said, okay, Lord, I know. You're right, I know. And then he just opened up the doors and the avenues and everything to make the way possible. So then in verse 20, it says, Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to them, um, to to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he in whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by, the holy, by a holy angel and summoned you to his house to hear the words, to hear words from you. Then he invited them in. That's a huge step. He's inviting Gentiles in the house now. Peter's growing. He's getting it. God's working in his heart. He invited them in and lo they lodged with him. And the next day, Peter went away with them. And some brethren with Joppa or from Joppa, accompanied him. We're going to learn later. Peter took six men with him. So now Peter's making his way back up to Caesarea. He's taking six men plus the three that have come from Cornelius' house. Peter, so far, what does he have? The Lord's working in his heart. He's working to do a new thing, a revolutionary thing. Something that has been talked about in the Old Testament that God would be a light into the Gentiles as well. as So the, it, he's, this is working according to Scripture, but it's also working according to certain providences, according to miracles, according to you know practical, tangible things. All these things are sort of coming together and... 
from Cornelius' side, you see him taking steps of faith. From Peter's side, you see him taking steps of faith. And now Peter's on the move. And think about where he's going. He's going to where the Roman army is stationed. Think about the things that have happened recently that he saw Jesus killed by the Romans. Caesarea where, is where Pontius Pilate, who is in charge of the law in Jerusalem, who gave Jesus over to be crucified, that's where he was stationed. They actually found an inscription in Caesarea on a stone that says Pontius Pilate. It's an amazing discovery. So he's going here, and all he knows, and I love this, he's not thinking of, about a pros and cons list like we talk about. He's thinking about the Lord told me to do this and not to doubt. That's all he needed. So in verse 24, it says, The following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and he fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. In other words, we don't worship human beings. Even Peter, even... In, in Peter's church, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, in the Vatican, there's a statue of Peter. And that statue is missing a big toe because people go up and kiss the big toe of Peter. And they've done it so much, they're missing the big toe. But not only the big toe, they're missing the second toe. Because when the big toe went away, they started kissing the second toe. But not only his second toe, yeah, he's missing all his toes. <laughs> and Peter, I bet he would love to come back and say, stop kissing my toes. Don't worship me. So Peter lifts him up. He says, stand up. I'm a man. And, he's, and, and as he talked with him, he went and he found many who had come together. So Cornelius is, he's exercising this little faith that he has, which is kind of a lot of faith, but he doesn't know, but he wants to know. And he's, he gets his vision, and then he gathers all these people, friends and relatives, they're all, all on his house. And verse 28, and then he said to them, Peter, you, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or go to one of another nation Peter said that sorry but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean Peter is now giving us the interpretation of those animals that were on the sheet and what he's saying now is God is, is teaching him that that was about people. That no people are unclean. No people are uncommon. Those were the, the typical terms they would use, Jewish people would use for Gentiles. They were unclean and they were common. It was, it was so bad if you were a Jewish person and come across a Gentile woman or non-Jewish woman that was giving birth you could not help her because you would, if you did so, you'd be breaking and violating their law because you'd be helping bring a Gentile into the world. That's how radical it was it. The, the priests the, and the Pharisees that would wear the robes, they had to walk with very little shuffle on their feet. Their steps were very small because if their robe whipped and actually sort of touched a Gentile, they would be unclean. So this is how radical you have to put yourself in the context of what's going on. But a bigger context is see how Christianity breaks down every barrier of race, every barrier of nation, every 
barrier that in, in Christ there's none of that. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female nor slave nor free. In Christ, there's none of that. There never should be any of that. And Jesus came to demolish that, that wall of separation that Ephesians chapter 2 talks about. Jesus came to demolish that. That means that Jesus doesn't look at people like that. That Jesus looks at their heart. And, and this is revolutionary for the church, for the beginning of the church. This is what the church was all about. This is what Jesus came to do, to save mankind and to get rid of those barriers that separate mankind ethnically. So he says in verse 29, he says, Therefore I came without objection, and as soon as I was sent for, I asked then for what reason have you sent for me? So, so Peter's like just explaining from his angle what happened, and Cornelius says, well, from my end, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here whose surname is Peter, he is lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea, and when he comes, he will speak to you. And so I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. And now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. They're saying, okay, here we are. Tell us what to do. What do we do? You are one of his disciples tell us what to do we're ready man that is a preacher's dream to have people waiting to hear what you have to say they're anxious they're open they're ready they're excited and so what does peter say in verse 34 peter Opened his mouth. That's a good start if you're going to say something. <laughs> and he said, in truth. I love that. Because he starts off and he says, and remember, there were so many philosophies, so many Greek gods, Greek mythology, so many um, false gods. There's hedonism. All this crazy, crazy stuff going on. And he just starts, like, he opens his mouth, and he says, in truth. Basically, what he's done is say, what I'm about to say is the only truth. Everything else is not true. I'm going to tell you the truth. Not what you want to hear. Not what maybe customs will dictate. Not what society wants me to say. And, and remember, when people were saying the things that he was saying, they would often be persecuted, jailed, and killed. So, and, and he's in the, the Roman fortress, the Roman military, but he doesn't care. He says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Why is there... So much confusion about racial relationships. Why is there so much confusion about how we are to be in regards to other people of other races or other homelands or whatever? It's right. It's so simple. This is what I love about the Bible. It just is so simple. Hey, in God there's no partiality. But you know what that does it dismantles the systems that are being pushed upon our society to try to fix partiality. The systems that are being pushed, race, critical race theory, which comes from Marxism, the idea is to create equality by showing partiality. 
so in order to fix the problems and this is this is how things work in the world because if they're not based in truth they they fall at every point they have a point where it doesn't work in Christianity we have the truth and we know we're never going to get to a place where we realize oh wait a second this is not working this doesn't work the truth always works because God made the the world in a certain reality and the truth is what helps us operate correctly in the reality that God has established. Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. And so he brings counterfeits and things that may look nice and helpful and loving and kind. But if it's not the truth, it's not loving, not kind, and won't work. And you take this one statement. Imagine if this statement was, was taken by the Christian church at this point and lived out wherever the gospel went. There would have been no slavery in America. At least the church would initially come against it. The church later came against it. But then there, there were others who in the church, Christians that actually um, were for slavery in our country, but that was also going on in the whole world in many uh, instances. But the point is, the way God sees things, to have a biblical worldview, is there's no partiality. And we should never carry ourselves out in any way where we're showing any partiality, especially in an ethnic, racial type of way. This is what God is bringing down. And in their day, this is, this is something that's a, a human condition. And that's why there's really no fix to racism. Because unless someone's born again, naturally, instinctually, in our flesh, we're going to be that way. We're going to show partiality and we're going to deem other people in many cases as lower or less than that's what happened in Nazi Germany the Jews there's a propaganda campaign that went out that tried to get people to think that Jewish people were unsanitary and unhygienic and that's why you see in those days pictures of Jewish people would often be caricatures and they would look like rats or they'd call them rats and it made people or desensitized people to a, a way where they were okay with in many cases with with what was happening to them because the propaganda went out and people saw them as subhuman or less than human so if you understand that's in human nature and that's been something that's part of been part of the human race from the very beginning, it's only the gospel that breaks down those barriers. Amen. And the gospel does do that. And the, the church should be the freest place in the world because in the church there's no partiality. It's just a bunch of messed up people worshiping the Lord together, celebrating His forgiveness. So he says, he opens his mouth, truth comes out. He says, God doesn't have partiality. Now remember, Peter had been partial. It was probably shocking that this is coming out of his mouth. He still struggled with it, with it after this. But he's getting it. In verse 35 it says, But in every nation, whoever fears him, God, and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace throughout or through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea. And it began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, John the Baptist, 
And he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses. That's key right there. Peter saying, we, including himself, he's saying, I saw all this. I saw it. Including those others too. We are all witnesses of all the things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he was going around talking to people, um, enjoying fellowship with people, touching people, letting people touch him, eating with people. And he's saying, this, this Jesus who, who was dead, he's saying that as someone who saw what happened. He was going around freely. And people were seeing him. And as they're, they're seeing him, this amazing work of God through Jesus Christ. In verse 42, he, he commanded us after that to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to judge the living and the dead. And, and imagine Peter saying that. He's saying, Jesus, the, the one who did all these miracles, the one who God sent, the one who's going to be a judge, the one who died, I saw him die, the one who rose again, I saw him rose, rise again, the one who is openly going around after he commanded me to go tell you. So imagine the motivation that Peter had that he, he would need because he was eventually killed. Tradition has it being crucified upside down for saying what he's saying here. But Jesus, the, God himself told him to do the, these things. And so he did it. Verse 43 says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, Whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. That's so key because what does it mean to be saved? It means that our sins are dealt with. Our sins are gone. That's what it means to be saved. So then that begs the question, if that's the problem, how else can, how else can we make our sins go away? Doing good can't make your sin go away. We need our sin to go away. So that pretty much just refutes every religion that bases its salvation on works. Because the whole, I, the whole point is our sin is what keeps us from God. And only belief in Jesus, as we see here, will wash away our sins. That means only Jesus who was God incarnate and was sinless and died on the cross in our place. Only he could do that. There's no argument that there's another way to heaven or Jesus is equal to Muhammad or Buddha. There's no argument. They didn't stay in the grave. They didn't rise from the dead. They, they weren't God incarnate. They don't have the ability to forgive sins. It's all about the ability to forgive sin and only one can do that. So in verse 44... Why Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, that's the circumcisions is the Jews, as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. That's huge. This is a big thing. This is a game changer. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that 
These should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stay a few days. And so in verse 1 of chapter 11, now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea. So now we're getting another view. Of, so we're, we're in Caesarea on the coast, on the Mediterranean Sea, where the Romans were, where the soldiers were. This amazing work of God happens. The Gentiles hear the word, get saved as a result of God working through prayers. He brings together Jews and Gentiles. The church is made up. The church is forming here of Jews and Gentiles, of all who come in the name of the Lord to be saved and believe in Him. And then now we go down to Judea where most of the Jews were. And it says that they heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So notice that too. Being saved is receiving the word of God. So that's what it means. That the word of God comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the word of God is preached and the word of God is received and they believe on Jesus Christ, then there's something that happens on the inside of a person. They're regenerated. They're a new creation in Christ. And then those Jews in the area of Jerusalem, they're hearing about this. In verse 2 it says, When Peter came up to Jerusalem, so now Peter leaves Caesarea and he goes to Jerusalem and the reason it says he went up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is elevated. So you always go up to Jerusalem because it's elevated. So when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, the, the Jews, they contended with him. So like, what's up? You went into a house of a Gentile and you're like preaching the gospel to them and they're getting, they're, you're not supposed to do that. And they said, you went into uncircumcised men and you actually ate with them? Are you kidding me? But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning saying, hey, I was in Joppa, I was praying, and I went into a trance. I saw a vision, and an object came down from he heaven. With There was a great object, and it, had, it was like a sheet. It had four corners, and it, it came to me, and I saw it, and I observed it intently, and I considered, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds, of the air, so pigs were in this blanket <laughs> as well. And I heard a voice <laughs> saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, and said, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And at that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was having been sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them. Doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren, that's how we know they're six earlier, accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell us your words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. This is like the Gentile Pentecost. 
Then I remembered the word of the Lord and how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He says, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I would withstand God? I love that. So is, is I don't know, you might want to say dug in or stubborn, resistant as Peter was, when he was convinced in his heart it was the Lord, then he would say, who am I to, to say no to God? I think that's a very good thing to think about. Who are we to resist God? Who are we when God is working in our heart and opening up doors and avenues and ministries and things like that to say no? It makes me think... Is it possible that the church is shrinking because there are people who are saying no? When God is sending, is there those who are resisting or saying, well, I don't want to do that. I like my gig. I don't want to give that up. I don't want to sacrifice that. I don't want to go through that. It, I, I wonder about that. Because when, when we read about how God was working in the church, the Holy Spirit was powerfully moving on people to go and do amazing things, and those people had to answer the call. But sometimes... When our life can get so comfortable, we can really resist the things of God and we can even do it in a way where in our heart we know it's God, but we say, no, nah, that's not the Lord. And we might start saying things like, I have a good job. I like where I live. I don't want to rock the boat. And you might say, well, how do you know that? Because that's what I did. I had a great job. I got paid to take kids surfing. I was a youth pastor at a church close to the beach. And parents loved when I took their kids and they got rid of their kids and we went surfing all day and they're out of the house. I love my job. And I didn't know anybody out here. I didn't know what the Lord was going to do. I didn't know how that was going to look or how that was going to work. But I know God was calling me. And I was convinced of that. And I got to a place too where I had to say, who am I? Who am I to say no? And I'm glad I didn't say no. I'm glad the Lord had convinced me in my heart where I couldn't say no. Because I think about how things would be different. I think about all the things that God has done by saying yes. The experiences. I wouldn't be the same person. I wouldn't have had the same life, which I love and I'm thankful for. And so it makes me think, has the church gotten to where we're not seeing that anymore? We're not seeing these movements of God on people's hearts. Because I don't believe God stopped doing that. I don't believe God has said, you guys are good. Just relax, sit back, sit tight, enjoy. I don't believe God is saying that. I, I believe God is saying, hey, the fields are white. They're ready for the harvest. Pray for laborers to go out in the harvest. So just something to consider and to pray about. It's the Lord putting, putting things on your heart. It's the Lord stirring your heart. And I would encourage you just this one thing. And I'll tell you, I don't know why I'm telling you so many testimonial type of things tonight, but this made me think a lot. But I, I remember sort of what I think sparked my openness for working uh, or being open for God to work in, in my heart was 
One time I was at a men's retreat and the, the pastor was doing a message from Isaiah 6. And he kept saying, here I am, send me. And I said, I'm just going to start praying that. And I just started praying that. And I meant it. And then not long after that, our church on a Sunday night, we actually had Richard Wormbrandt come and speak at our church. And I don't know if you know who he is, but he, he was uh, tortured for Christ is the book that is about him. He was imprisoned in communist Romania. There's actually a movie out about it, which is I highly recommend it. It's very good. Tortured for Christ. But he came and spoke at our church. He, I don't know how he, he was very old, maybe in his 90s. And two people had to be on the side of him. And they walked him out. And, and he was tortured very bad. So a lot of, he had a lot of physical problems because of that. But he, he got up there, and I, I remember him talking about the importance of loving your brethren. And not only that, showing and going out and showing and demonstrating the love of Christ in a sort of missionary type of way. And I remember seeing that. I was totally blown away. I, I was just like... I don't even know what I was do I'm doing. I'm, I'm living in Orange County. I mean, this is awesome. But it, it just, you know, you don't have to feel bad if the Lord has blessed you. The point is, are you, have you closed yourself off to the Lord doing a work like this? Are you open to that? And here's the thing. You don't have to be afraid because I think fear is something that keeps people away from that. Like, well, if I say, here I am, send me, what if he actually does that? And what if, like... I go somewhere I don't like and all that. And here's the thing. If God is calling you, there's nothing better than being in His will wherever it is. So it's funny because about the same time that God led me to Texas start start a church, another assistant pastor at our church went to Hawaii to start a church. Wow. And I thought, Lord, come on. <laughs> Hawaii and Texas, what's the deal? But the, the point is, there's no paradise on earth except for being in the will of the Lord. If you're in the will of the Lord, it's paradise. And it doesn't matter where you live, what you live in. It doesn't matter um, your status in life. If you're in the will of God, that is paradise. And that's what I've learned. So let's finish out here. Um, Got a little sidetracked. So, verse 18. But when they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And so now, as you see the church making dramatic steps Growing Now the Gentiles are involved. It's spreading across the world at this point, the known world at this point in Colossians chapter 1, I believe. But so Paul points out that the gospel has gone out to the whole world in just like 30 years, the known world at that time. And that was because many people said yes. Many people responded to the calling of God. So... It says in verse 19, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. You remember that? Stephen? Stephen, the martyr. He got killed, the first martyr of the church. We read that earlier in the book of Acts. Well, because of that, the hostility in Jerusalem caused the believers in Jesus to have to leave Jerusalem. And it says... Uh, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, which was up north on the Mediterranean coast, probably 100 miles from Jerusalem, and Cyprus, which was a Greek island, and then Antioch, which is now modern-day Turkey. But, you know, this, is a, this place, Antioch, is amazing. This, this, is, this is really where the first missionary activity took off. This is where great teachers began and started throughout the centuries. This, and I encourage you to do a little historical 
reading on the biblical city of Antioch. It's amazing. So we're going to see a little bit of that here. So um, the gospel went out to those places, Antioch, and it says, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. So in those areas, they hadn't got word that, hey, the gospel's not just for the Jews only at this point. So some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene was like northern Africa. Cyprus is uh, Greek, the area of uh, Greece, Greece, I believe. It says, who when they had come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists, those are the Greek people, preaching the Lord Jesus. So this is groundbreaking stuff. Now, you ha actually have these two mentioned that are like missionaries. So this is the first time we're seeing this type of activity going from Cyrene and Cyprus, and they're going to Antioch to conduct missionary endeavors preaching the gospel to the Greek, the Hellenists. And so in verse 21, it says, And the hand of the Lord was with them. Does that sound familiar? We just talked about John the Baptist and in Luke 166 and it says, The hand of the Lord was upon him. And see, that's what happens when you answer the call of God. That's why you don't have to fear. That's why you don't have to resist. That's why you don't have to wonder, is it going to work? How is it going to work? Because if the hand of the Lord is upon you, that's all you need. That's everything you need. So ask for the hand of the Lord to be upon you. It says, And a great number believed, and they turned to the Lord. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So now back in Jerusalem again, where the first church was really started. Stephen was persecuted and killed there. So going back to Jerusalem, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So Barnabas was the one who helped Paul with the believers in Jerusalem because the believers in Jer Jerusalem were afraid of Paul because Paul had been killing believers. And now Paul got saved in Acts chapter 9. And Barnabas was the one saying, hey guys, he's legit. You can, you can talk to him. You can hang out with him. He's legit now. So now Barnabas shows up again. And in verse 23 says, When he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. What a great ministry. He's there and he's encouraging them. Like, all right, that's awesome. Guys, keep going on with the Lord. Keep, keep heading forward. Keep going strong in the Lord. And you might face persecution, but keep going. And he's there encouraging them. So these believers in Antioch get Barnabas to come and, and encourage them in their faith. And says in verse 24, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, or Paul. So where was Saul, Paul? Where has he been? Well, you remember when he first started getting accepted in Jerusalem, he started preaching there. He was run out of town. He went back to his hometown. This is probably 12 years later. And Barnabas goes and he, he goes and he says, well, let's read it. He's, he goes there and it says in verse 26, when he had found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And so it, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church. And what did they do? They taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. See how cool this place is? Why were they called Christians? Antioch was a very immoral town known for business and commerce and immorality. They were probably making fun of them. That when they that word in Latin, the IAN, IAN in Latin means party of. 
So they just said, that's the party of the Christians. And they're probably making fun of them. Kind of like somebody, you know, there's a thing not too long ago, Jesus freaks. Maybe somebody called you a Jesus freak. And then people like, oh, I'm a Jesus freak. They like embraced it. Like, yeah, I am a Jesus freak. Yeah, I'm a freak for Jesus. So the early church is the first time. That's why we're called Christians. It started in Antioch. And those in Antioch said, oh, those are the party of Christians. They're like Christians. And so in verse 27, we'll finish here. And in these days, prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hand of Barabbas, and Saul says so a very unique thing see, we're seeing here too. So money was sent from Antioch from a different ethnic people to Jerusalem to a different ethnic people. So now we're seeing charity. Many people believe this is the first time that the world has seen charity or it's recorded of charity from one ethnicity to a different ethnicity, not within ethnicities. So this early church is filled with the Holy Spirit. There's teaching, there's preaching, there's par no partiality, there's the fruit of the Spirit, there's benevolence, there's care and concern, there's missionaries being sent out, there's monies being sent out, and here you have the church. Amazing, isn't it? So not much for a conclusion since we're over, so let's pray.